On the 6th of December, 1916, a ship sank in the Atlantic Ocean. While this itself is an unusual, this ship was actually carrying on board a dinosaur. Neither the ship nor the dinosaur have ever been seen again. This particular ship also played a part in the story of the sinking of the RMS Titanic on April 15th, 1912. This is the full story of the ship that sank with a dinosaur on board. This is the story of the SS Mount Temple. Okay, let's get right to it. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Like, for real, I'm so excited to share this story. The SS Mount Temple isn't widely remembered, especially outside of its association with the story of the Titanic, but she has such an interesting story and it's rarely told. So let's start her story with some background of the ship itself. In 1901, the SS Mount Temple a new passenger cargo liner being built by the Armstrong, Whitworth, and Company of Newcastle for Elder Dempster Lines was launched, following a two-year development period. She was shortly purchased afterward by the Canadian Pacific Railway. Though not particularly famous, she was a proud ship and carried her passengers well. The ship was 485 feet long, 59 feet wide, had a steel hull and was registered at a weight of 7,656 gross register tons. Her two engines produced 694 horsepower, giving her a speed of 12 knots. The early years of the Mount Temple's career were exciting. She transported regiments from the British Army to the South African War. The Mount Temple made several trips from New Orleans at this time. She carried remounts from North America to South Africa, going from New Orleans to Durban, on three occasions between 1901 and 1902. The exact date of these trips were November 5th to December 7th, 1901, February 4th to March 8th, 1902, and finally April 30th to May 28th, 1902. After this, the Mount Temple entered normal passenger service. No dinosaurs on board yet, but we're getting there. Be patient, Spino. This ship has more interesting stories to cover. But I'll get to something a little more exciting if it makes you happy. In 1907, the Mount Temple, while carrying over 600 people on board her, was sailing in overcast weather that was spitting out snow squalls. Around midnight, the second officer was left in command of the ship, with orders from the captain that he was to be roused if the weather got worse. At 2 a.m., the weather did just that. The vessel ran into a series of snow squalls, and these grew stronger and stronger. By 2.30 a.m., visibility had severely decreased. Visibility actually became so poor that one couldn't even see down the full length of the ship. Thinking a ship was spotted ahead due to a light appearing, the second officer attempted to steer around the mystery ship. But it wasn't a ship. It was a lighthouse. The Mount Temple then ran aground on the rocks off the West Ironbound Island. Her hull was ripped open and water began flooding the engine room and extinguishing the boiler fires powering the ship. To make matters worse, the ship was then struck by a massive tidal wave that washed over the deck and slammed into her side, smashing half of the lifeboats. While this might sound like a death sentence that a ship could never survive, the Mount Temple did survive. The Mount Temple fought a good fight for survival, and against the odds, she won. The passengers were successfully evacuated once the weather cleared up, and in April 1908, she was finally refloated and traveled under her own steam back to port for repairs. She sailed first to Lindbergh, then to Newport News, Virginia, where she was repaired over three months. Now, on to what this ship first became truly noteworthy for in history being one of the very first ships to respond to a certain SOS on the night of April 15th, 1912. Yes, when the Titanic sent out her SOS, calling for help on that cold night, the Mount Temple was one of the first ships to hear her call and respond. 
Let's get to that part of the Mount Temple story. We'll get to the dinosaur in due time, though. I promise. At 11.40 p.m. on April 14, 1912, the RMS Titanic struck an iceberg on her maiden voyage. The ship had a series of small openings made in her hull, and it was just enough damage that the ship would sink. At the time, some thought that the iceberg tore open a 300-foot-long gash in Titanic's hull, but actually, it was a bunch of small little slivers, basically the longest being nearly 40 feet, where the berg ripped open the seams in the hull and popped the ship's rivets. While the Titanic could float with four compartments flooded, five were flooding after the collision, and that was a death sentence due to how much water would fill the bow. The bow would settle so low from the weight that the seawater flooding the ship would spill over the bulkheads at E-deck, and then it would just keep flooding each of the aft compartments back and back as the ship got lower. To put it simply, with that amount of underwater damage, the Titanic couldn't stay afloat. As such, though most didn't know the Titanic was dying, her crew began preparing the lifeboats, and the Titanic's wireless operators, John, Jack, Phillips, and Harold Bride, sent out a distress call. Phillips initially sent out the standard call for assistance, CQD, but then switched partially to SOS since it might have been his last chance to use it, as Bride said to him. One of the very first ships that received the call was the SS Mount Temple. The Mount Temple's captain, Captain Moore, was roused after the second SOS was received, and he assessed the situation. He was under orders to avoid any areas with icebergs, but he chose to turn his ship around and steam directly for the Titanic instead. Preparations to rescue survivors were carried out as the ship began her mad dash northeast across the ocean towards the sinking passenger liner. The Mount Temple was roughly 61 nautical miles from the Titanic when she began heading towards the fellow liner, and it would take about four hours for the Mount Temple to reach the Titanic. Knowing this, the captain told his chief engineer to do whatever it took to coax any extra speed out of his aged vessel. Meanwhile, the off-duty crew were roused and briefed, and the lifeboats were uncovered and made ready, along with plenty of ropes, ladders, and lifeboats. I know the Carpathia gets all the attention for her mad dash through the ice field to save Titanic's passengers, and credit's where it's due because it's remarkable she even made it. But the Mount Temple deserves a mention too. Mount Temple's crew also ran their ship at full speed straight into packed field ice, an action which could have easily resulted in their own vessel striking a berg and sinking and their own passengers needing rescue. As the ice began to grow thicker and thicker around the Mount Temple to mediate the risk of their ship also striking a berg, Captain Moore posted extra lookouts to aid in avoiding icebergs. Now around this time, it was 3 a.m. and the Titanic was already gone, and it would have been well over an hour since the last SOS signals cut out. And there was an odd little incident which occurred around this time. The Mount Temple encountered something, a single green light in the ocean. No one seems to have a definite answer as to what this was. It could have been a schooner of some kind, or even one of Titanic's lifeboats with the crew lighting a green flare to get the attention of the passing liner. We'll never know, though. It's one of the many mysteries that still prevail from that night. Either way, the Mount Temple took evasive action to avoid this little green light and continued to Titanic's last reported position. However, the ice became too thick, and the Mount Temple had to reroute her course to avoid the thick pack ice. She finally reached Titanic's last reported position at around 4.30 and found nothing. No lifeboats, no survivors, no wreckage. The Mount Temple was actually still east of Titanic's position at this time, and there was an ice field between the Mount Temple and the place the Titanic went down. Come daylight, Captain Moore sighted the Carpathia and the Californian, once informed that the last of the survivors had been picked up by the Carpathia, the Mount Temple reversed her course and resumed her planned voyage away from the site of the disaster. Unfortunately, like the SS Californian, the Mount Temple did not escape the story of the sinking of the Titanic without controversy. The Titanic was this amazing ship that was this symbol of progress and man conquering nature and the elements. When she sank... On her maiden voyage of all times from a near iceberg, 
taking 1,500 people with her, people wanted someone to blame. Some of the passengers who had been on the Mount Temple said that they'd been close enough to the Titanic that they not only saw the ship, but watched her sink, and that their ship had failed to act in any kind of rescue operation. Some people today also tried to redirect blame off the Californian, not that the Californian could have done anything anyway, and on to the Mount Temple, but that's just dumb. Neither ship was close enough to have been able to change anything. Not even the Californian, despite what people like to say. Her boilers were cold. Even if she, her wireless set had been on, she wouldn't have been able to get to the Titanic in time to do anything. Neither ship was close enough to have been able to change a thing. After the Titanic sank, the American and British inquiries into the sinking ignored the rumors about the Mount Temple being close enough to see the ship. Experts on the history of the Titanic stand by the fact that it would have been impossible for both the Mount Temple to see the ship, as well as have played any more of an active role in the rescue. Again, there was an ice field between her and the Titanic. Nonetheless, people still try to spread misinformation about the Titanic and the Mount Temple to this day. Right, now on to the part of the story that this video is actually about. The dinosaur. Not the dinosaur on screen, that's me, but the one who was on the Mount Temple. As I said in the title, the Mount Temple had a dinosaur on board her when she sank in World War I. So let's get to that story. The dinosaur... The dinosaurs, which were being transported on the Mount Temple, were found in North America. They were taken to the Mount Temple to be transported safely. Now what were these dinosaurs? The Mount Temple had two hadrosaurs on board her called Corythosaurus, meaning helmeted lizard. This is a genus of hadrosaur duck-billed dinosaur from the Upper Cretaceous period, which existed from 77 to 75 million years ago. So let's talk about Corythosaurus and how two of them came to be on a steamship in the middle of World War I. The first Corythosaurus specimen was found in 1911, known as AMNH 5240. It was found by Barnum Brown in the Red Deer River, Alberta, Canada. Barnum Brown named the type species in 1914 as Corythosaurus Cazurius. He published a more detailed description on the animal later in 1916. This herbivorous dinar, dinar, this herbivorous dinosaur had a prominent crest on its head, and they averaged around 30 feet in length. Over 20 skulls have been found of this animal since these originals were found a little over a century ago. Its mouth was narrow, its skull was short, and it had a helmet-shaped crest. Among the other fossils Brown described was this one, skin impressions from the abdomen. Now the two best preserved specimens of this dinosaur were on board the Mount Temple for transport. She was no longer just a passenger cargo transport, but now a dinosaur transportation steamship as well, like the Venger in the Lost World. Unfortunately, this was in the middle of World War I, and these two specimens would become lost along with the Mount Temple, and neither have ever been seen again. As the story goes on, it's kind of wild to think that this all happened on one ship. Not many get such a dramatic career. She had such a rich history and now her story has reached its climax. This is how the story of the Mount Temple ended. With the outbreak of World War I in 1914, the British Admiralty began to enlist liners into the service, most famous cases being the Olympic. But other ships played in the game too, such as the Britannic and the Lusitania. Though both of those were separate circumstances entirely, but the Mount Temple was right there alongside them. She was even fitted with three-inch naval guns on her stern for defense. 
The Mount Temple was requisitioned on August 12, 1914 to serve as a food and troop transport. By August 1915, the Mount Temple was released by the Admiralty and back into commercial service in October 1915. Though after this release, she did still transport 1,200 German prisoners of war back to England who had been captured after the Battle of Los. But like the Lusitania had been when she was sunk in 1915, the Mount Temple was once again a civilian ship, not a warship. Mount Temple departed on what would be her final voyage on December 3rd, 1916. The Mount Temple's planned ultimate destination, after a few stops, was Liverpool. Her captain was Alfred Henry Sargent, and her crew consisted of 109 people. There were also 710 horses on board, 3,000 tons of wheat, 1,400 cases of eggs, thousands upon thousands of cases and crates of apples, and two dinosaurs. The two Corythosaurus had been freshly rounded up and were being taken to their new home at the British Museum. Well, Spino, you couldn't. They were already fossils. The Mount Temple was a little over 600 miles from Fastnet Rock, Ireland, when another ship appeared and chased her, catching up to her. It was the SMS Move. The Move chased down the Mount Temple and then fired a shot over her bow. The Mount Temple's crew manned their own guns, and once they did, the Move fired again. Her firepower was superior, and she struck the Mount Temple hard at the funnel and boat deck. Mount Temple's guns went quiet after that. The passengers and crew were evacuated, which is what you're supposed to do if you're sinking a civilian ship. That's one reason the sinking of the Lusitania caused such outrage the year before. The passengers and crew were given no warning before the ship was torpedoed. You're supposed to let passengers get off a civilian ship before sinking it. Three of the Mount Temple's crew died in this battle to save her. Once the over 100 passengers and crew were evacuated, explosives were placed on the ship and she was scuttled. The cargo hold the fossilized dinosaurs were in flooded and they were taken to the bottom of the ocean with the Mount Temple as she went down. Neither the dinosaurs nor the ship have ever been seen again over a century later. The Mount Temple still rests somewhere on the bottom of the ocean a rusting, corroded wreck that is only a shadow of what she once was. But just maybe, just maybe, she is still holding on to that final assigned task and holding those fossils safely in her hold. And maybe, if she is ever found, then just maybe they can be recovered. It would be a fitting end to this story, the idea that the Mount Temple is still protecting those fossils, still loyally guarding what she'd been entrusted to protect, even as a deteriorating wreck, is a nice thought. Wishful thinking, most likely, but a nice thought. The passengers who had been on the Mount Temple were ferried to Germany on a captured British ship, the Yarrowdale. They arrived in Germany in December, and the U.S. citizens who were among them were released in late March, since the U.S. was still neutral at the time. The others were interred and processed as POWs. In April 1945, the SMS Move was also sunk as a German freighter under the name Oldenburg. She was strafed by heavy cannon fire, burned, and sank. Her wreck has also never been discovered. If you think of an old ocean liner that is sinking, what is one thing that might come to mind first from such a scenario? Well, stories like the sinking of the Titanic in 1912 immortalize one line in particular, women and children first. For a long time, I never really thought about it, assuming it was just the mindset of the time to get the most vulnerable off a ship before everyone else. A courteous thing. Maybe because there weren't enough lifeboats for everyone? But actually, Women and Children First comes from a tragic event. One that has been all but forgotten today, but it is an incredible story, and it still lives on in its legacy. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of the HMS Birkenhead, which sank in 1852 at Danger Point. 
If you enjoy stories and content like this and you want to see more like it, like and subscribe so that I know you want more of it. Okay, let's get to the story. Birkenhead began her career as a simple frigate with the name HMS Vulcan, the name of the character mounted on the front of the ship, Vulcan being the god of fire in Roman mythology. The ship was laid at Birkenhead, England, and launched on December 30th, 1845. She was very quickly renamed to HMS Birkenhead. The ship was 210 feet long, and she had two steam engines which could produce 564 horsepower. Like other early steamships from the time, such as the Collins Line passenger liners, like the SS Pacific, she was propelled by two paddle wheels, which were 20 feet in diameter. The ship also had eight watertight compartments, which could be closed off in the event of flooding, but because of the way certain bulkheads were positioned, the actual total of watertight compartments was 12. She also had two masts, with a third being added later which could be used for sail power if the need arose, and at the time it often did. Back then, it wasn't at all unusual for ships to break down and be weeks overdue because of mechanical problems. Take the story of the passenger liner California, for example, from 1881. She was discovered by the SS Bywell Castle having been drifting helpless in the ocean due to her engines breaking down. She was nearly a thousand miles from land when she was discovered and towed back to land. This kind of thing happened all the time back then, so having an alternative means for propelling your ship across the ocean in the event of your engines failing was a good precaution. Inside Birkenhead, her engines and compartments were protected by a strong body because she had an iron hull. She was reclassified as a troop ship in 1851. She never actually got the chance to serve as a frigate, and there were two reasons for this. The Royal Navy warships were switched from paddle wheels to propeller propulsion, as recent experiments from the time showed that this was a much more efficient method of propelling your ship, outclassing paddle wheels. The second reason was that the Admiralty had doubts about the effects of cannon shots against iron hulls. Recent experiments had also shown that cannonball striking an iron hull led to a hole which could be hard if not impossible to plug back up. Birkenhead's maiden voyage was in 1846, and the ship traveled to Plymouth, keeping an average speed of 12 to 13 knots throughout the voyage. She had sporadic use around England, Ireland, and Scotland over the next few years. HMS Birkenhead assisted in the refloating of the SS Great Britain. Britain? The SS Great Britain. <laughs> SS Great Britain, not Bitten. The SS Great Britain was a fellow iron ship, and it's actually a ship that still exists today, preserved as a museum ship. An exciting moment in Birkenhead's career also came when she ran down and sank the brig Ontario in the English Channel. The owners of the ship then sued for the loss. Birkenhead was found to be at fault for the incident, as she had no lookout posted at the time due to her crew being short-handed. Birkenhead never served as a warship, but she did carry those entrusted to her on fast and more comfortable trips than her fellow wooden sail-powered ships. Now then, that's enough history. Let's get to what you all clicked on the video for, the incident that was the catalyst for the infamous Women and Children First Protocol in a disaster scenario. HMS Birkenhead left Portsmouth in January 1852 under the command of Captain Robert Salmond. She was convoying troops from 10 different regiments who were all going down to the Cape Colony to fight in the 8th Kosha War. The 8th. Okay. She picked up additional officers and soldiers in Queenstown, including the families of the officers, their wives and children. When she docked briefly near Cape Town on February 25, 1852, most of the women and children disembarked along with several soldiers who had fallen ill. Nine cavalry horses were loaded onto the ship, along with an additional 35 tons of coal to feed the ship for the last leg of the voyage. From there, HMS Birkenhead departed from Simons Bay at 1800 hours, with possibly as many as 643 men, women, and children on board her. The exact number is unknown, and I'll explain why in a little bit. 
Deciding to make the best speed possible, Captain Salmon chose to have the ship hug the South African coast, keeping within three miles from the shore. Using her paddle wheels, the Birkenhead kept up a steady speed of 8.5 knots, and the sea was calm and the night was clear as they headed out of False Bay to the east. Shortly before 2 o'clock in the morning on February 26th, Birkenhead was traveling at about 8 knots. She was keeping good speed up and sailing with no issues. Her passengers were being carried reliably to their destination. The captain decided to check the depth, and the leadsman made a sounding of 12 fathoms. Before they had a chance to make a second sounding, there was a monstrous crash that likely threw everyone off their feet and onto the deck. HMS Birkenhead had struck an uncharted rock, and I'm sure the calamity was like a monstrous crash in what had been moments earlier a quiet and still night. The rock still lies near Danger Point to this day, and we have its exact coordinates. You can easily go see it, especially if the ocean is rough. But in calm seas, it's harder to spot, and on a calm night, it would have been near impossible. The HMS Birkenhead's forward section was sitting in water at two fathoms deep, while her stern sat in water 11 fathoms deep. The captain ordered the engines to be reversed and the anchor dropped. The ship backed off the rock, but the water now gushed freely into a giant open hole in her hull. At this point, the ship was lost, even with watertight bulkheads, and the inevitable could only be delayed, not prevented. The HMS Birkenhead was sinking. As water filled the ship with what I'm sure was a tumultuous crashing and roaring, no doubt everyone on board was rushing to assess the damage and help the civilians get out on deck from below. But the water would have kept rising and everyone would have quickly realized that the ship was lost. And like with the Titanic, perhaps the event where women and children first is remembered most and associated most with today? There were insufficient lifeboats for everyone on board when the Birkenhead began to go down. And that situation was only made worse. And I'll explain why in just a second. 60 men began working and trying to pump the water out of the ship, but it only took minutes for the forwardmost compartments to flood. And this happened so fast that over 100 sailors drowned in their berths before they even had a chance to react or escape the flooding. The survivors began to gather out on deck as another 60 men were assigned to the tackles of the lifeboats while everyone else was gathered aft on the poop deck to balance out the weight of the water and raise the bow section. Now, the lifeboat situation was made unfortunate by what happened next. The ship's number of lifeboats were already limited, but as water rushed down the corridors and filled the interior of the ship, two of the large boats were loaded. These could hold 150 people each, but one was swamped and the other was unable to be launched due to the poor maintenance, paint, and just general upkeep of the winches. I'm not sure why they couldn't maybe float them off as the ship went down, but they couldn't. And this meant only the smaller lifeboats were available to be used in the evacuation of the ship. And there were only three of these. Everyone still alive assembled on the deck, and Lieutenant Colonel Seton of the 74th Foot took charge of all military personnel. He stressed the importance of keeping calm and maintaining order among his officers and adhering to the discipline that they were trained to have in such situations. One survivor described the situation as this. Almost everybody kept silent. Indeed, nothing was heard, but the kicking of the horses and the orders of Salmon, all given in a clear, firm voice. Due to the limited space on the lifeboats, women and children were prioritized and put into the boats first. This was the first time in history where the very concept of putting women and children into the boats first was used. Doing so would later become known as a Birkenhead drill. It became standard following this event in evacuations of ships as a courageous behavior in hopeless circumstances. Knowing that if everyone jumped ship and rushed the lifeboats, they would be swamped and the women and children would be drowned, Colonel Stetton ordered his men to stand fast and stay on the ship, and only three jumped ship and made for the lifeboats. Though the horses which were on board were freed and driven into the sea in the hopes that they'd be able to swim to shore, eight of them managed to do it with the ninth breaking its leg and I don't think it survived. The soldiers, meanwhile, stood together on the deck, shoulder to shoulder, until the very end, even as the ship broke apart underneath them. 
Ten minutes after the first collision, the ship's engines were still turning astern, and the Bergen had again struck the rocks beneath the engine, this time completely tearing open her bottom and she broke apart right away, just after the main mast, throwing several people into the sea and causing her funnel to collapse and fall off the side. The forward section of the ship went down instantly, and the stern remained afloat, crowded with soldiers. They stayed together on deck, no one moved, and the ship continued to break apart and sink. It's a tragic image to imagine, but also kind of inspiring, too. These men likely were terrified, but held to their training and discipline and stood bravely and calmly together on the deck as the ship sank out from underneath them. Birkenhead sank only 20 minutes after the first collision. A few soldiers from the ship managed to swim the two miles to shore over the next 12 hours, hanging onto the breeze to help keep them afloat, but most were drowned or eaten by sharks. One survivor of the sinking, a Lieutenant J.F.G. of the 43rd Light Infantry, said this in a letter to his father. I remained on the wreck until she went down. The suction took me down some way, and a man got a hold of my leg, but I managed to kick him off, and came up and struck out for some pieces of wood that were on the water and started for land, about two miles off. I was in the water about five hours, as the shore was so rocky and the surf ran so high that a great many were lost trying to land. Nearly all those that took to the water without their clothes on were taken by sharks. Hundreds of them were all around us. I saw men taken by them close to me, but as I was dressed, having on a flannel shirt and trousers, they preferred the others. I was not in the least hurt, and am happy to say, kept my head clear. Most of the officers lost their lives from losing their patience of mind and trying to take the money with them, and from not throwing off their coats. The morning after the sinking, the schooner Lioness found the wreck site and rescued the survivors. 193 people in three lifeboats survived, out of the 638 who had been on board. The survivors consisted, as best as we can guess, due to the record books of all who had been on board going down with the ship, of 113 soldiers, 6 Royal Marines, 54 seamen, 7 women, 13 children, and one male civilian. The highest ranking survivor of the sinking was Captain Edward W.C. Wright of the 91st Argyshire Regiment, and he was made a brevet major for his actions during the ordeal. So, what do you think happened after the sinking to the sailors who had been on the ship? Well, a bunch of them were court-martialed. Yeah. As you can imagine, this drew a great deal of public interest. The court hearing occurred on the 8th of May, 1852, on board HMS Victory in Portsmouth. Fun fact, the HMS Victory also is a ship that still exists, and it is actually the oldest Navy warship still in service in the world. None of the senior naval officers of the Birkenhead survived, and none of those brought forward at the trial were found blameworthy for the accident. Those who were there testified how Order and regularity prevailed on the ship, from the moment it struck the rock until the very end when she disappeared. They added that, that there was no confusion or noise as everyone followed their orders, like they always did, even though their ship was going down. Like I said, it's kinda inspiring that these soldiers stood together on deck until the end, likely knowing they were not going to survive. I'm clearly not the only one who thought so. Frederick William the Fourth of Parasia was so impressed by the valor and bravery and discipline those on board had until the very end that he ordered an account of the story was to be read at the head of every regiment in his army. A lighthouse was erected near Danger Point to warn shipping of the dangerous reef, and it stands like a sentinel, overlooking the spot where the ship went down. The lighthouse is 59 feet tall, can be seen from 25 nautical miles away, and still stands to this day. A memorial plaque was added to it later on. Another memorial was put up at the Chelsea Royal Hospital, ordered by Queen Victoria herself. Thomas M. M. Hemi, 
painted a depiction of the sinking in 1892, titled The Wreck of the Birkenhead, showing everyone standing on the deck to the end. I featured it earlier in this video. In 1977, the South African Mint issued a gold coin commemorating the 125th anniversary of the sinking. Though the ship has kind of fallen into obscurity today, it does still hold a powerful and potent legacy, including a rumor that she was carrying a military payroll consisting of three tons of gold coins, totaling of worth of 240,000 pounds. The rumor says they'd been stored in the powder room before the ship left on its final voyage and that they went down with the ship when it sank. There have been numerous attempts made to salvage the gold, the wreck has also been found. The water it sank in wasn't deep, so it wasn't terribly hard to find. More on that in just a minute. The Salomon's Dam Nature Reserve in South Africa is also supposedly named after Birkenhead's captain, Robert Salmon. Also, locals to the area still call the great white sharks in that area Tommy Sharks, in reference to the Tommies eaten by the sharks in the water during the sinking. Tommies being a slang term for common soldiers in the British Army. Another legacy of this incident was, of course, women and children first becoming standard for evacuation in a scenario where a ship was sinking or just needed evacuation, becoming best known for its association with and its use during the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. I, like most people today probably did, first heard of the protocol in relation to the story of the Titanic. This protocol is known as a Birkenhead drill, and after this incident, the practice of Women and children first became standard in evacuation of a sinking ship. The wreck of the Birkenhead is, as you can imagine, a bit of a mangled mess, considering the ship's violent end where it was tearing itself apart. But a few bits are still identifiable, such as the paddle wheel shaft you see on screen now. The wreck isn't in deep water, only 98 feet down. You can dive down and see it. And I'm not sure when it was first discovered, I couldn't find a date, but people were visiting it by 1958. And many people have visited it since. One reason people dive down is to try their hand at finding the gold coins supposedly held within the ship. Whether or not any are really down there is unknown. The wreck is frequently visited and disturbed, despite being a war grave. The 1958 visit tried to find the gold, but all the salvage team recovered was some brass and anchors. The only gold coins ever found at the site seem to have been ones the passengers and crew had on themselves as the ship sank. If a large cargo of gold coins exist, they still rest somewhere within the hull, undiscovered to this day. In 1989, the British and South African government officially agreed to share the gold between them if it was ever recovered. But if any is actually down there in the wreck remains unknown. So many videos ago now, I promised a video on the sinking of the Felicity Ace, a roll-on, roll-off cargo carrier ship that sank in 2022. Well, today that promise is being fulfilled. This video is basically just a sequel to my video about the MV Cougar Ace. So hello everyone, I hope you're doing good and are ready to hear a story. Not gonna be a romance story to rival Titanic or anything, but if you like sinking ships, you're in the right place. If you enjoy these kinds of stories, check out my video on the capsizing of the MV Cougar Ace, my deep dive into the disappearance of the SS Waratah, my video about the sinking of the Princess Alice, and my video about the scariest ghost ship in history, the Orang Madan and my several other videos about maritime mysteries and stories. I have a whole series dedicated to ships which have disappeared. Like and subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content so that I know you want more of it, and let's not waste any time. Let's start with the backstory of the Felicity Ace. First, let's have a look at the ship's design. Felicity Ace was designed for the dedicated task of carrying vehicles, cars and trucks in most cases, across the ocean. She was 656 feet long, her beam was 106 feet rounded up, her dead weight was 17,738 metric tons, and her internal volume was measured at 60,118 gross tons. Her call sign was 
3ECX4. She was laid down on December 9, 2004, launched on July 2, 2005, and completed in October 5th of that year. She was registered in Panama but built in Japan. Her owners were the Mitsu Corporation, the same company from the video we did about the similar ship MV Cougar Ace. Now, looking at the picture on screen, Spino, can you please move? Thanks, bud. I love ships in general, but I find the the boxy kind of look that these RORO carriers have is just satisfying to look at. They're nice and compact looking with nice colors. They're just nice looking ships. It'd be really cool to see the inside of one. Felicity Ace's power came from a single main diesel engine rated at 20,500 horsepower. That's a lot of horses. Good thing we don't need them to pull ships across the ocean. That'd be a long swim. With that high horsepower, Felicity Ace could travel at a speed of 22.3 knots or 26 miles per hour rounded up. Her propulsion was through a one screw single shaft. Felicity Ace was delivered to Mitsui OSK Lines in Tokyo on October 5th, 2005, registered under the ownership of Aurora Car Maritime Transport under the Panama flag. After 2011, throughout 2022, her registered owner was Snowscape Car Carriers SA, but she remained under Mitsui OSK Line Management. Her career from late 2005 until 2022 was, from what I can find, pretty uneventful and productive. However, an event would occur on board the Felicity Ace in 2022, which would be her death sentence. And let's get to what that was right now. While sailing from Germany in early February 2022, carrying within her a cargo of 3,965 Volkswagen Group cars, which included 1,944 Audis, 1,117 Porsches, 85 Lamborghinis, and 189 Bentley model cars, disaster would strike the Felicity Ace. Six days after leaving Germany, on February 16th, 2022, a fire broke out within her cargo hold. Oh no, it's the Orang Madan all over again. Felicity Ace was sailing in the North Atlantic Ocean at the time, and a battle to save her began. A fire at sea is no joke. Seriously, a fire at sea can cause a ship to sink. It won't just burn the superstructure, but not damage the hull. If it's bad enough, it can and will sink the ship. The crew quickly realized that they couldn't get the fire out, so whatever efforts they initially had were quickly stopped, and they abandoned ship. All 22 of them were all rescued, leaving the Felicity Ace to her smoldering fate. The Felicity Ace floated abandoned and aflame, but she didn't sink. If a ship could fight to survive, I'm sure the Felicity Ace was giving it her all. As she burned, the Portuguese Navy rescued her crew. Lithium-ion batteries in some of the electric cars in the ship were reportedly what caused the fire having ignited unexpectedly. And they could also apparently only be extinguished with special equipment. However, there is no proof for certain that this is actually what caused the fire though this was an early theory put forward and even reported on by the media. The loss from the cargo is estimated to be between 334 million and 401 million US dollars. As the ship continued drifting following her abandonment, probably glowing in the night and being hidden by a cloud of smoke in the day, she was followed for 110 miles by a Portuguese Navy patrol ship. Attempts were made to extinguish the fire and tow the ship ashore before she could founder. I'm sure her going down was a major worry. On February 18th, eight days after the Felicity Ace left Germany, salvage company Smith Salvage was contracted to salvage the ship. Tugboats with firefighting equipment were brought in, along with additional salvage craft and more firefighting equipment also joining. And these all set out for the ship after being assembled. By the 23rd, the Felicity Ace was still afloat. And I don't know if she was ever boarded again during this time frame by even a skeleton crew or a salvage crew or a firefighting crew. I didn't see anything about her being board, boarded up to this point. But I imagine that someone might have been sent on board to make sure the fire had burnt at least to a manageable level. The Portuguese Navy, however, did doubt that the ship could be towed due to her sheer size. 
the Felicity Ace continued to burn and drift guideless in the Atlantic Ocean for another week. She was finally boarded again at last by a salvage team from Smith, who were able to stabilize her. The fire had either burnt out or was extinguished by this time as well, and things were finally looking up for the ship. She'd seemingly won her fight for survival, and a tow line was rigged to take her back to shore for repairs. Things did not stay so positive, though. In fact, they abruptly took a turn for the worst. As if the fire wasn't bad enough, things only got worse from there. Less than a month after the fire, news broke out that the Felicity Ace had capsized from the damage. Not only that, she reportedly sank shortly after as well, on March 1st, 2022. I hope no one was on board at that time, but no one died during this whole thing, so if anyone was, it seems that they got off the ship safely. Felicity Ace had finally lost her fight, though. She developed a 45-degree list to starboard prior to capsizing. She went down in rough seas at around 9 a.m., roughly 220 miles from Azores, an autonomous region of Portugal in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm guessing that, unlike with the Cougar Ace, where the cargo was recovered, this ship took all the cars she had on board with her to the bottom of the ocean, if any had even been salvageable following the fire. It is unknown if any oil pollution, contamination, or spill occurred from the sinking. Reportedly, oily residue was left behind on the surface after she went down, at least according to the Portuguese Navy. The situation's severity has not really been determined, though, from what I've read. At the sinking site, the water was 10,000 feet deep, and as far as I know, her wreck has not been discovered. Her end was not a gentle one. Her final month afloat was filled with calamity after calamity. Hopefully, she at least rests somewhere that is calm and quiet on the ocean floor, perhaps providing a home to sea life. A peaceful image is nice to imagine, especially after such a tumultuous end. She rests on the same ocean floor that is the final home to ships like the SS Pacific, and the RMS Titanic, and the MS Hans Hentoff, and the MS Muken, and so many more. So, even on the ocean floor, in the dark, she's not truly alone. It's just kind of beautiful in a way. In 1878, a Royal Navy vessel would sink in the English Channel. It would be one of the worst peacetime maritime disasters up to that point in history. But apparently it didn't end there. Even to the modern day, people still claim to see this ship sailing in the English Channel, right over the spot where she sank beneath the waves. This HMS Eurydice was the second ship with that name. The first was laid down in 1777 and broken up in 1834. That first ship has quite the story too, serving in the American War of Independence, the French Revolutionary Wars, and the Napoleonic Wars. Quite the career, but today we're focusing on the second HMS Eurydice, not the earlier one. As I touched on in the intro, she, the new Eurydice, was ordered in 1841, laid down less than a year later in 1842, and she was launched and completed in 1843. She was later recommissioned three times, in 1846, 1854, and then in 1877. The second Eurydice was a very fast 26-gun frigate, and she had a very shallow draft bottom of her hull so she could operate in shallow water. Originally, she had service in North America and the West Indies from 1843 to 1846. During this time, she was under the command of her first captain, George A. Elliott, the eldest son of the ship's designer. In summer 1845, the Eurydice was driven ashore near Havana, Cuba. But she was later refloated. Under the command of her second captain, she spent her second 
commissioned career around the station at the Cape of Good Hope. And then during her third commission, she saw service in the White Sea during the Crimean War, which lasted from October 1853 to February 1856. And it was part of the larger Ottoman Wars in Europe and the Russo-Turkish Wars. After that, she was returned to her old haunts and was again in service in North America and the West Indies. Eurydice saw no further seagoing service in the next 20 years, and she was eventually converted into a stationary training ship for 16 of those years, from 1861 to 1877. So in the interest in keeping the backstory brief, we'll move on from the history to the events which led to her sinking. As you will hopefully agree, the ship did have a colorful career, but now it is time to cover her tragic end. Eurydice was recommissioned in 1877, now under the command of, I believe, her fifth captain, Marcus Augusta Stanley Hare. She sailed from Portsmouth in southern England back to North America and the West Indies station for a three-month tour. In early 1878, she departed the Royal Navy Dockyard in Bermuda for the return trip back to Portsmouth. She crossed the Atlantic quickly in less than three weeks. When she was then caught in a snowstorm off Dinoz, a cape on the Isle of Wight in the English Channel. She then capsized and sank in Sandown Bay, reportedly onto her port side, and water began flooding in through her open gun ports. This was in the winter, so the water was frigid, and only two of the 319 crew and trainees on board the ship survived the sinking. Four men were picked up from the water by the schooner Emma, but two passed away after being rescued. Those that weren't trapped inside or went down with the ship mostly froze to death in the icy water. Being trapped inside a capsized ship as it sinks sounds terrifying. I cannot imagine how scary that would be. Captain Hare was a devout Christian, and after he gave the order for those on board to save themselves into abandoned ship, he clasped his hands together and voluntarily went down with the ship. And you know who witnessed the sinking? A young Winston Churchill. He was three at the time, but he watched it all go down. Literally. I know he didn't see her ghostly apparition, but he did see her sink before she became a ghost ship, so put me on r slash technically the truth if you must. He technically saw the ship, so I didn't lie. The Eurydice was salvaged the same year she sank and broken up. In the art you see on screen, she is being towed to Portsmouth Harbor after her sinking. An inquiry determined that the ship had sunk through the stress of the weather and that her officers and crew were blameless for the loss. Some were critical of the ship's design as it reduced her stability, but another 26-gun frigate of identical tonnage replaced her nonetheless. The HMS Juno, later renamed the HMS Mariner, and then the HMS Atlanta. She disappeared at sea without a trace. I'm going to leave that one there, because I might talk about her in another video on ships which vanished at sea in the future. Just know that she took her 281 crew with her, and some see the sinking of the Eurydice as a prelude or a premonition of this event. Now, on to what y'all clicked on this video for, the sightings of the Eurydice after she sank. Ever since sinking, the Eurydice has been sighted by sailors many times, still sailing as if she'd never sunk. It would be unnerving on a dark night seeing the ship sailing by, especially when you consider how many people died in her sinking. The Eurydice is said to haunt the Dinos, most often seen at the southwestern end of Sandown Bay, near the village of Lacum. It is said the Phantom, a three-masted ship, vanishes if you try to approach her. Some experts have said that the Phantom Eurydice is merely an atmospheric phenomenon, freak reflections of light and mist. However, in the 1930s, so around 60 years after the sinking, a Royal Navy submarine under the, under the command of Commander F. Lipscomb was forced to take evasive action to avoid a full-rigged three-masted ship which was sailing right towards them. They were able to just avoid striking the vessel. The submarine crew then watched as the mysterious ship sailed past and vanished in the place the Eurydice had sank. 
In another story from 1998, over a century after the sinking, Prince Edward, yes, that Prince Edward, reportedly saw a three-masted ship off the Isle of Wight. He claimed they spotted the phantom ship while filming a TV series called Crown and Country on the Isle. He was telling the story of the sinking of the Eurydice. And yes, that is in the episode. I watched it. When someone in the TV crew shouted that there was a three-masted schooner out at sea. They watched it draw closer to the shoreline, and then it vanished. The film crew claimed to have captured its image on film, but when they went to review the footage, the tape reportedly jammed. And an interesting final note in this story is that it was reported by sailing ship historians and enthusiasts and just general people who were in the know that no sailing ship was in that area at that time. I did find one supposed picture of the ship that they did capture on film, but I could not verify the source, so I'm not going to show it here. But the picture, if authentic, does show a ship that matches the paintings of the Eurydice we saw earlier in the video. Prince Edward said this about the incident. We were talking about a ghost ship on the Isle of Wight, and how we could illustrate this three-masted schooner that just disappears. Suddenly, someone said, Look, there's one now. And sure enough, out to sea there was a three-masted schooner. It was not arranged by us, it simply appeared. Someone else said, we'll wait until it gets a little closer to the shoreline. And then come the moment, someone else said, where's it gone? We looked, and it had disappeared. Prince Edwards added, I am quite convinced as far as ghosts are concerned. There is something definitely out there, but what it is, I do not know. You can find this documentary on YouTube and watch it if you want to. The episode Isle of Wight is the one that they were filming when they spotted the ghost ship. Another interesting little detail about this story is one that I learned while watching the episode where he talks about the Eurydice. Is that someone hundreds of miles away had a premonition of the Eurydice being in peril moments before she sank, knowing exactly what was wrong with the ship even. And... Some of the family of the deceased had their relatives who died in the sinking apparently visit them before they learned about the sinking. One such story is from the sister of James Turner, a Marine who died in the sinking. She claimed her brother appeared at her bedroom door, dripping water from his clothes, and what might have been a final goodbye. Just under three years before the sinking of the RMS Titanic, another ship, which would go down in history and become later known as Australia's Titanic, would disappear without a trace. A ship which was also considered to be unsinkable. Hmm, we've heard that one before. She took all 211 crew and passengers with her, and none have ever been seen again. Not even a trace has ever been found. In fact, they disappeared so utterly that not even a single life belt or piece of debris was ever found. This story is simply and utterly baffling. Many searches have been commenced since she vanished. One individual named Emlyn Brown even spent 22 years searching for her wreck in the area she was last known to be in, but found nothing. The ship was utterly gone without a single trace. Today, I will tell you the story of the SS Waratah, a mystery that has gone unsolved for over a century. Waratah was 465 feet long when constructed from 1907 to 1908. She was a blue anchor line ship and completed her sea trials in 1908. She also passed all inspections from her builders, owners, the Board of Trade, and Lloyds of London. The original order for the ship was placed in September 1907 with a construction period of 12 months. By W. Lund and Sons, Barclay Curl of Glasgow was hired for the project with it being a new cargo and passenger vessel for the aforementioned 
blue anchor line. The Waratah was laid down at Barclay Curls Clyde Home Yard and later launched in September 1908, a year after the original order had been placed, as hoped for. Waratah's sister ship was the SS Gee Long. In August 1909, Geelong would actually be among the ships searching the ocean for her vanished sister, Waratah. Sadly, Geelong wouldn't last forever either. She would be sunk in the Mediterranean on January 1st in 1916, just under seven years after the Waratah would vanish. I bring Geelong up for an additional reason. Because when Waratah was being designed, she was being designed to be an improved version of the already existing Geelong, which launched in 1904. So most of her specifications were based on Geelong. Waratah was able to move at a speed of 13.5 knots on average, while Geelong could average a speed of 12, though she could push herself to 14 if need be. Waratah had a crew of 154 on average, 423 passenger cabins, and along with an additional 600 spaces for temporary dormitories in the holds and lifeboat and raft space for a total of 921 people. Remember, this was before the sinking of the Titanic, so the issue of there not being enough lifeboats wasn't really a mainstream issue at this point. Waratah cost 139,900 pounds to build. Her captain was Joshua Edward Ilbury, who had been the captain of Waratah's sister ship. Waratah also had no wireless set, meaning if she did become distressed at sea, then she would be on her own and have no way to contact land. While Waratah was on her maiden voyage in 1908, it was reported by her second officer that there was a fire in the lowered starboard bunker that extended all the way to the engine room. It was brought under control by noon that day, but it continued to reignite for the next four days until December 10th. Uninsulated steam valves were found to be the cause of the fires, and repairs were done in Sydney under the supervision of the chief, and they were done to their satisfaction. From there, Waratah made a few more trips until arriving in London again in March of 1909 to finalize her maiden voyage. She unloaded her cargo and was put into dry dock for inspection and underwent a few minor repairs at this time. The captain and crew of Waratah criticized the ship for her stability and handling, the captain even bluntly saying the ship was not as stable as his previous vessel. These comments caused some heated words to be exchanged between the captain, the ship's owners, and the ship's builders. On April 29, 1909, only a few months before she would disappear, the Waratah set out on her second trip to Australia. She was carrying 193 steerage passengers on this trip, along with 22 cabin passengers, a crew of 119, and a large cargo. The trip was uneventful, and the steamer arrived on June 6, after roughly a three-week trip. At port, the steamer unloaded around 970 tons of lead ore, and then continued down to Melbourne. And on this leg of the trip, she had to plow her way through a strong gale, which complicated her berthing on her arrival on June 11th. From there, the ship continued down to Sydney, once she arrived, she loaded her new cargo for the return trip. Once the cargo was loaded, which consisted of flour, wool, dairy, frozen meat, and 7,800 bars of bullion, she left port on June 26 and made a few more stops before arriving in Durban. This leg of the trip also had 100 passengers, as well as a convict who was being extradited to a Transvaal colony, along with an escort of true Transvaal policemen. Fun fact, while in Durban, one Claude G. Sawyer, an experienced sea traveler and engineer, had felt nervous about the behavior of the ship during his voyage, and had even experienced a premonition in dreams, which he saw as a warning to leave the ship. He sent a telegram to his wife in London, saying that the ship had arrived in Durban, and that he felt she was top-heavy and he left the vessel while it was in Durban. The ship would vanish after leaving port, and this decision saved Sawyer's life. Had he stayed on, the number of missing would instead be 212. At 8.15 p.m. on July 26, 1909, the Waratah left Durban. She had 211 passengers and crew on board. 
on July 27 at 4 a.m., she was spotted astern by the steamer Clan McLintry. And as Waratah was the faster ship, she gradually came level with the Clan McLintry. And by 6 a.m., the two ships communicated with each other via their signal lamps. If you don't know what those are, you know the scene in Titanic while the lifeboats are being lowered and you see the lights on the bridge wings flashing? That's what those are, signal lamps. It would have been the same general setup on the Waratah. So the two ships communicated, and they shared who they were and what their destinations were, general information that was customary to share. Waratah then overtook the Clan McLintray near the southeast coast of the colony of Natal, at the mouth of the Banshee River. The Clan McLintray would lose sight of Waratah when she passed over the horizon at 9.30 that morning. This was the last confirmed time the ship was ever seen. Other unconfirmed sightings did occur over the next few days, and we will cover them later in the video. For now though, let's carry on with the events that followed the last confirmed sighting. Later that day, the weather took a turn for the worst, with experienced captains calling it the worst they'd ever seen. With the captain of the Clan McLintry even saying it was the worst he'd seen in 13 years of sea experience. Strong winds and high seas are not uncommon in the region, and this swell had in fact developed into a hurricane by July 28. Since Waratah was considered unsinkable, man, we really gotta stop calling ships that, and since it wasn't uncommon at the time for ships to sometimes be weeks overdue, when the ship didn't arrive on schedule, no one batted an eye. The absolute worst case scenario people initially thought was that she'd had a medical, a uh, medical, I'm gonna leave that in. Maybe it'll make you laugh. The worst case scenario people thought initially was that she'd had a mechanical problem and broken down and was adrift. However, fears for her safety and the safety of her passengers and crew began to grow when other ships traveling the same route reported no signs of her on the entire length of their voyage. The first of August 1909 saw the first search effort when the tugboat T.E. Fuller was sent out to try to locate the Waratah. This search was abandoned when the weather again turned poor. Royal Navy cruisers HMS Pandora and HMS Fort, along with later the HMS Hermes, were deployed to search for the Waratah, with Hermes specifically focusing on the last place the ship was confirmed to have been sighted. Hermes also encountered waves in the region where the Waratah was last sighted, so massive that she was heavily damaged and had to be put into dry dock for repairs. Numerous more ships joined the search. Remember earlier I mentioned that the Waratah's sister ship, Geelong, was among them. The German steamship Goslar even kept a special watch specifically for the Waratah for 1,262 miles of ocean. Still nothing. One ship, whose name I'm going to put on screen because I'm going to butcher this, the Insinzawa, reported spotting bodies near where the Waratah was last sighted, but they turned out to merely be dead stakes. Look at that. Stakes showed up in my Loch Ness Monster video, and here they are again, too. Someone make a conspiracy theory. Despite all the ships looking, and the utter lack of any sign of Waratah or any wreckage of Waratah's August continued, Hope remained that the ship was still afloat somewhere. Waratah had enough provisions on board to last everyone a year, so even if she drifted hundreds of miles off course, they would still be alive. Due to her lack of a wireless set, it would be impossible for the ship to communicate unless another vessel passed close enough for visual communication to be established. On December 15, 1909, with no sightings of Waratah for over four months, she was officially labeled as missing at Lloyd's of London. In early 1910, family members of passengers on the Waratah came together and charted their own rescue mission, hiring the ship Wakefield, which conducted a 15,000 mile or 24,000 kilometer search over a period of four months. Again, nothing was found. As the years began to pass, occasional scattered reports of wreckage being found would pop up. Rumors of a life preserver marked Waratah washing up on New Zealand cropped up in 1912. In 1925, Lieutenant D.J. Roos of the South African Air Force said he'd spotted 
a wreck which matched the Waratah while flying over a coastline. Timbers, possibly from Waratah, also washed ashore in East London in 1939. However, keep in mind that with previous instances of ships vanishing without a trace, it's not been uncommon for false artifacts to wash up months or years later. Check out the story of the SS city of Boston for an example of this kind of hoax. Back then, all the rage seemed to be with making fake messages and bottles from ships which vanished and then letting people find them washed up on a beach. As far as I know, the only time something like this has been considered legitimate was in the case of the SS Pacific. Point is, none of these stories of items from the Waratah have been confirmed, and they should not be treated as any kind of proof of the ship's fate, unless proven otherwise. Modern searches have had no better luck when it comes to finding any trace of the Waratah. I mentioned Emlyn Brown at the start of the video. He spent 22 years searching for the Waratah from the early 1980s to 2004. In 1999, he thought he'd found the ship while working alongside the National Underwater and Marine Agency and author Clive Cussler. And newspapers reported that the wreck was found off the eastern coast of South Africa, resting on the seafloor 10 kilometers out to sea. A sonar scan showed a wrecked ship which seemed to match the lost SS Waratah. A dive to the site in 2001, however, revealed that the wreck had been wrongly identified as Waratah, and the wreck was actually that of the SS Nelsie Meadow, a ship sunk during World War II. On May 8, 1943, the SS Nelsie Meadow had left Cape Town for Bombay. During this trip on May 11th, she was torpedoed by German submarine U-196. And after finding a picture of the Nelsie Meadow, yeah, I can see why it would be misidentified as Wartaw. They look similar to each other. They have a very similar shape. In 2004, Emlyn Brown declared that after 22 years of searching, he was giving up. He said, quote, I've exhausted all the options. I have no idea where to look. As I mentioned earlier, unconfirmed sightings from July, in the days after the last confirmed sighting of Waratah, came up too. If any of these are valid, remains unknown. But here is each known one. I'll let you make up your own mind. Just like with the Orang Madan and Loch Ness Monster videos, I'm going to tell you the evidence and then let you decide if you think any of them hold some truth or not. First comes from the ship Harlow on July 27, 1909. Remember that Waratah left Durban on July 26. The last confirmed sighting of her was in the morning of July 27, and she was expected to reach Cape Town on July 29. This possible sighting by the Harlow occurred in the evening of July 27 at 5.30 p.m., 17.30 hours. They saw the smoke of a steamer on the horizon, and the smoke was so thick that the captain of the Harlow wondered if this mysterious steamer was on fire. After darkness fell, they saw the steamer's running lights approaching them, still 10 to 12 miles back. Suddenly, they saw two bright flashes, but heard no sound due to the distance, and the lights vanished. The Harlow captain thought the steamer exploded, but his mate convinced him that it was brush fires on the shore, a common thing that occurs. The captain agreed and opted not to record the incident in the log, and only thought back on the incident as being significant after he learned that the Waratah had vanished. According to the captain of the Harlow, the ship was around 180 miles or 290 kilometers from Durban when the incident occurred. Keep this story in mind as it will come back up later in the video. Exactly four hours later on that same evening, a Union Castle liner, whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce, here it is on screen, which was traveling north from the Cape of Good Hope, passed a ship. And they exchanged signals by the signal lamps, though due to the rough seas and bad weather, they could only make out the last three letters of the passing ship's name. Those letters apparently were T. A H. In my opinion, out of the unconfirmed sightings, I think this one probably is the only one that was an actual sighting of the Waratah. It can't be confirmed, but that's my opinion. I think that this was probably the last actual sighting of the ship. Another sighting was not reported until 1929, and I don't really know if I believe this one. Eyewitness testimony is, of course, the least reliable form of evidence, so... 
Again, I'll just let you make up your own mind. The story was reported by Edward Joe Conker. He was a Cape Mounted Rifleman. According to him, on July 28, 1909, he observed through a telescope while conducting a military exercise at the mouth of the Ixora River a steamship which looked like the Waratah struggling slowly through the rough seas, heading southwest. He watched as the ship rolled heavily in the rough seas before, while already being pulled partially over, a powerful wave struck her, swamped her, and caused her to fully roll over and then quickly vanish from view. According to Conker, his orderly sergeant did not take the matter seriously, and as a result, he never came forward with his story until 1929. The story is definitely possible, and it is in line with one of the theories about what caused the Waratah to vanish, but remember, eyewitness testimony is the least reliable form of evidence, so I'll leave you with the story and let you make up your own mind on whether or not you believe Conker or not. With the last confirmed sighting, when the weather changed, and all of these unconfirmed stories in mind, I'd say that whatever happened to the Waratah probably occurred on July 28. Before we cover the theories about why Waratah disappeared, it's worth mentioning what happened because she disappeared. Blue Anchor Line's ticket sales for their liners dropped. Severely. And the criticism directed towards the company did not help either. And the loss of sales and the huge financial loss of Waratah all combined, and in the end it forced the company to sell many of its ships and then voluntarily voluntarily liquidate itself, beginning in 1910. In this section, we are going to cover each of the main theories about the fate of the Waratah. After we go through each one, tell me which one you think is the fate that befell the ship, or if you have your own theory based on your own research. I'd love to know. First up, is the most widely accepted theory today, the idea that the ship was struck by a rogue wave. As I said, I'm pretty sure that this is the most widely accepted explanation for the disappearance of the Waratah. Rogue waves, also known as freak waves, are common in that area of the ocean south of Africa. The theory goes that during the storm, while already dealing with stability issues, the Waratah was struck by a massive wave, and these can sneak up on you and just come out of nowhere, which is what makes them so scary. This wave would have either rolled the ship all the way over, or flooded her hold and pulled the ship underwater and sank it within seconds after being swamped. If the ship capsized quickly, it's likely any buoyant debris would have been trapped below her and sank with her, hence why there's no wreckage anywhere to be found either washed up on a beach or drifting out in the ocean. Such waves have also broken ships apart and caused them to sink in minutes as well. Now, as an expansion of the rogue wave idea, we have my personal favorite theory about the fate of the Waratah, the stranded in Antarctica theory. This theory goes that the ship was struck by a rogue wave, but it didn't sink. Instead, her rudder was damaged and the ship began to drift. Taken by the current, she was then pulled south and either sank somewhere way south of Africa or ran aground in or sank off, off the coast of Antarctica. There is no evidence for this at all, save the fact that no wreck of the ship has been found anywhere in the region that she would have expected to be in had she sunk. And remember, the ship had no wireless set, so if she did become disabled and drifted south, then she'd have no way to call for help. So something to keep in mind. Also, a fun fact that relates about this idea, in 1913, the Daily Mail thought their competitor, the Daily Standard, was copying them. So, they printed a false story about the Waratah being found in Antarctica, and the Daily Standard fell right into it, and they printed the same story. Anyway, the theory basically says that she ran aground somewhere or sank in Antarctica after drifting there following a strike from a wave, and simply hasn't been found. Moving on, here are some other ideas that are being tossed around. The next most popular theory seems to be the idea of a cargo shift. During the voyage, which she disappeared on, 
Waratah was carrying a cargo of 1,000 tons of lead, as well as an additional 300 tons of lead ore concentrate. The thing about that is, is lead ore concentrate is known to, in certain conditions, liquefy due to the motion of a ship. Yeah, that'll throw off your balance. And as we've established, Waratah left something to be desired when it came to her stability in good conditions. Basically, if lead ore concentrate liquefies, it can throw a ship off balance and cause it to capsize. Today, we understand that lead ore concentrate is a, ca is a hazardous cargo, and when ships transport it, safety precautions are put in place to protect the ship and the crew. Not back then. They didn't know this. There was basically no awareness to this issue back then. So this is certainly possible. In bad weather, with an already unstable ship, I could definitely see this causing Wartaw to capsize. So, like the Rogue Wave idea, this one is definitely very possible. Another theory is that the Wartaw was caught in a massive whirlpool. Now we're getting into theories here that aren't as widely accepted, so keep that in mind. These aren't quite as sound as the first ones. This one has been tossed around since the ship originally disappeared and continues to get brought up today, and it says that the Waratah was caught in a whirlpool created by a combination of winds and the weather at the time as a whole, currents, and a deep ocean trench. And there are a lot of those in that area. They are kind of common in that whole region off of southeastern Africa's coastline. While this theory does explain the lack of wreckage, no evidence today supports the idea that a whirlpool could be created, which is strong enough to suck down such a big ship. Remember, she was 450 feet long with a beam of 59 feet 4 inches. And it's thought to be highly unlikely, if not impossible, for a whirlpool to form that could suck a, su a ship that big down, basically instantly. Another theory is that the ship exploded. This theory comes from one of the possible sightings I covered earlier, specifically the Harlow sighting. Remember, the running lights on the unidentified steamer vanished after those two bright flashes of light. The theory goes that the Waratah was obliterated in a sudden explosion within one of her coal bunkers. However, no explosion like this would make a ship as big as the Waratah sink instantly, especially without leaving any wreckage. So this theory seems the most unlikely to me. In all honesty, I'd rank these theories as most likely to least likely in the order that we just went through them. Tell me what you think, though. So, which theory do I buy? I love the Antarctica one, but I think the Rogue Wave makes the most sense. I feel like the ship had to sink quickly and intact for no debris to be found. It's somewhere, but the fact that it vanished just so utterly is unnerving. You know, it's just gone, and so is everyone on board her. You know, I get it. Um, this happened over a century ago, and it's hard to sometimes personally relate to stuff that happened so long ago you know, that we are so removed from today. But those were people. Human beings, and they just vanished utterly. What happened to them? You know, for a lot of people today, their great-grandparents or grandparents were alive when this ship vanished. A century really isn't that long ago. And I think it's important to remember that. And you know, this ship has kind of fallen into obscurity, maybe in part to the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, but Titanic was almost in this exact same situation. The Marconi wireless set on Titanic broke during the voyage, and Phillips and Bride disregarded protocol and fixed the set. If they hadn't, no one would have heard Titanic's SOS, and today we probably would not know what happened to the Titanic either. Titanic would probably be just as mysterious of a mystery as Waratah if that had been what happened. Now what do I think? Again, I think the most likely thing is the rogue wave theory. The fact that the ship was unsteady in calm weather supports this. Rough weather 
uh, rough water and a giant wave just sound like a disaster waiting to happen. And the ocean is big. It could have happened anywhere, and it's so much space to look through that it's probably impossible to find the ship unless you search every inch of its route and then some outside of that, because in all likelihood the ship was likely off course a little bit after being rocked and moved around by the stormy ocean. Though again, I do love the idea of the ship drifting down and running aground in Antarctica. I think that could make a very cool speculative history movie. You know, the ship being hit by a wave but not fully capsizing and then drifting south while everyone tries to survive. Imagine finding it there one day, just run aground and coated in ice on some frozen beach in Antarctica. You know, I love that theory, but I don't think it's the one I buy. The story of the Waratah is something that I only recently discovered, but it captivated me. I'm so enamored with this story, and I hope one day that we find the wreck. I'm beginning to sound like a broken record, because in my paleo documentaries, I've talked about how much I hope we find more fossils of some of the animals I've talked about, like Gracepithecus and Auroran. So with all that said, I'm going to wrap this up. That was the story of the disappearance of the Waratah and the names of some of the lesser-known ships who all have their own stories, and who also vanished and in most cases without any trace ever being found. Out of all those ships which vanished, SS Pacific was the only one who left something behind that the ocean spat back out. You know, but each of those ships vanished just the same, and as just mysteriously. The ocean swallowed them all up the same, the ocean is a place of stories and some of the greatest mysteries of all time. And you know, the story of the Waratah is just one of those mysteries. The tip of a very large iceberg. Waratah is not even a drop in the bucket of stories. I'll let you ponder, and I'll sign off for now. I love mysteries, and I love ships. And when those two things come together, I'm hooked. Line, sinker, and all. Tell me what you think happened to the Waratah. Do you think she's a wreck on the bottom of the ocean off southern Africa in a place no one has looked? Maybe nestled at the bottom of some deep trench? Or do you think she exploded? Or do you think she drifted south and now rests somewhere on the coastline in Antarctica? I think I like that theory because it's not only a grand idea of a final voyage you can write a fictional story around, but also because if she did drift down there, she might be in decent shape, and if she's ever found, we might get answers. And I just like this idea because if she did drift down into Antarctica, uh, down to the coast, and ran aground somewhere down there instead of sinking, she'd still be there on that beach. And there's just that appealing feeling when it comes to, uh, to the idea of one of these grand old steamships still being out there and existing today, preserved when almost all of them have long since been scrapped and, for the most part, only now exist in paintings of a long bygone age. It's a cool idea. However, as much as I like it, I think she was probably swamped by a wave and no one has just looked in quite the right spot to find the wreck. Tell me your theory, though. I'd love to know. So thank you for watching. I hope you found the mystery interesting. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. And I hope you took something away from this fascinating story. The story of the Waratah is so captivating, and it really just makes you wonder what happened. Your imagination can picture any story of a, rap of a rapid sinking with people trapped inside the ship, or a desperate fight for survival as they drift further and further south towards Antarctica. And I hope you see why now. Again, thank you for watching. Check my other documentaries out. And until the next one. That's all for now. Have a good one, everyone.